who wants to join this session. My name is Tina Teilman. I'm a member of the program committee of Play the Game. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with this session with you and with all these excellent speakers that we are, we will hurry to get uh, in the, to hear their presentations. So we'll just start right away. Um, John, Professor John Norrit from the University of Brighton, and he will speak about making the world safe for capitalism, a critique of global sport and development. Here you are. Okay, thank, thanks very much. I um, need to make it clear that making the world safe for capitalism is in quotes, and it comes from a song by uh, English uh, singer and activist Billy Bragg um, in the Covert Army of the Marching Battalions, where he sings about making the world safe for capitalism. And one of the lines I've, I've always loved is, you know, if you, um, if you think that the army and the military is here to protect us, they're really here to defend wealth. And so that's the kind of uh, key point I'm, I'm starting from. And I've got a few slides here that I've used as kind of a guide and uh, visual images of, of what my thinking's about. I have put the entire paper on the Play the Game site, which should be up, I think, soon after the session. This is uh, part of a, a larger paper that I did um, a couple of months ago where I had 50 minutes to speak, not 12, so let me get right into it. The history of modern sporting forms and organizations demonstrates clearly that sports have become key components of the public relations machine, whereby public discourses celebrate the wonders of capitalist accumulation and growth as the only legitimate path to development and measure of success. I've explored the emergence of globalized sport in parallel with the development of corporate capitalism and examine sport as a legitimating institution that has done little to change the dominant world system propagated by the West and North and spread through the imperial and neo-imperial mechanisms of conquest, economic control, and political intervention. This presentation is part of a, a longer paper, as I mentioned, where I examine the Olympic movement, global football, uh, and sport and development in Africa and the Caribbean. Today I will speak briefly to the latter case with reference to the role and responsibility of academic programs and universities, which is the part of the equation that I work in. The majority of academic programs around the world continue to train students to become sport coaches, psychologists, athletic trainers, sport managers, etc. And I've spent the last decade working in a program that was designed specifically to teach people to manage sport. However, there are a few who remain to challenge the primacy of elite sport. Sadly, though, many critical voices are tucked away in departments where training of sport and fitness professionals is paramount. And I'll put it here to put up my basic background points that you can look at as I go through. Even the shift of some kinesiology and human movement studies departments to a foregrounding of health and fitness has not led to much in the way of critical <coughs> pedagogic uh, strategies being infused into the curriculum. The balance between sports science and coaching programs linked to the training and support of elite athletes and those exploring fitness across the lifespan has not altered the fundamental domi dominant knowledge bases in these programs which has recently been labeled by Andrews and Silk as mech kinesiology. However, there is one new hot topic area many departments are embracing, promoted by sport management and sociology of sport colleagues. This area is sport and international development. In Africa and the Caribbean, the body was central to the imperial project, though as much through the ways in which class was read onto the colonial body as race. Participation in modern sport was viewed as part of civilized development and the civilizing project, which was centered on the adoption of Western styles of dress and bodily deportment. The colonial project hinged on the support of traditional hierarchies in class and cultural distinctions, though it could by no means uh, control the outcome once sport was unleashed on the rapidly increasing urban masses in Johannesburg, Durban, Brazzaville, Leopoldville, Lusaka, Nairobi, or Lagos. The 
moralizing of leisure time and ideals of controlled development and capacity building still informs much of development discourse today and continues to be written over the top of local physical cultures. We now know that development as sold to the global south over the past half century has not succeeded in reducing the gap between rich and poor nations. Indeed, the chasm has widened. Thus, other means for achieving greater capacity in debates about growth versus sustainability have led to culture, environment, environmental stewardship, and sport as areas advocated where development could best be promoted. Since 2003, the United Nations has advocated for sport as a development tool. The UN Declaration of 2005 as the year of sport and physical education provided an official endorsement of sport as a technology that could contribute, among other things, to development, peace, local development, cultural understanding, and the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. Sport for Development has been analyzed from large event impacts and legacy to local context and any correlation between the two. With UN legitimation and an increasing awareness on the part of the IOC, FIFA, and leading clubs and leagues around the world, sport and international development has mushroomed as an area of both practice and study. The use of football as a development uh, and humanitarian tool has been present at least since the 1970s. Football can be exploited for various and diverse aims. Many NGOs specifically endorse football as a development tool. Sport and development has been relevant in peace building and as a tool to fight racism and ease ethnic tensions. Several authors have cautioned, however, that linking sports development with sports mega events and transnational sporting organizations may not be sustainable and in fact may be detrimental or divert money into showpiece projects that have little or no value to local populations. Two examples should su suffice for the moment. In St. Lucia, FIFA provided the funding for a new football stadium complete with a FIFA standard field. Unfortunately, the stadium is now used as a hospital since it sits on the south of the island near the international airport, but is two hours drive from the major population centers of the impoverished island. In South Africa, many showpiece soccer initiatives were displayed in the two years leading up to the World Cup during, and, and during 2010. These were nearly all located in the metropolitan regions of the three largest cities of Johannesburg, Durban, and Cape Town, areas already receiving the bulk of aid and infrastructural inputs. The rest of the country, by contrast, has fallen further behind these regions, leading to increased in-migration and greater disparity disparities between regions within the country. In its current practice at elite professional and mega event level, and promoted and sold as development, sports offers little that challenges global neoliberal economics and is operated in the developing world, mostly in what we would call the global south, promotes a neo-imperialism that perpetuates inequalities generated in the area, era of imperialism colonialism. While I am skeptical about the possibility of real societal change in and through sport, I suggest there are alternatives whereby sport can promote sustainable futures and challenge the status quo. We must open up debate whereby challenges to the practice of accepted norms such as Olympism, development, and character building are decoded and recast, particularly in terms of how we view sport pedagogically and how we envision sport as a vehicle for social and economic development in spaces of the global south and in marginalized spaces of the global north. In playing the game of global sports, however, nations, corporations, communities, and sports organizations race to host events, secure lucrative contracts, and to develop economies and societies through sport and sporting events. While all this has been happening, deindustrialization practices have accelerated with production shifting from developed to less developed societies. Playfair 2012, a group that monitored the labor conditions surrounding the London Summer Olympic Games, found evidence of child labor abuses, poor working and living conditions, poverty wages, and draconian work discipline at the Chinese factories manufacturing pins, badges, and London 2012 mascot dolls. It is impossible to suggest that sport and physical activity are social goods if the only social good it serves are the middle and upper class interests in advanced capitalist societies. 
Change is not easy. Merely shifting the focus of programs from the local to the global does not necessarily lead to positive change unless framed with an understanding of the complex histories and cultures and political economy issues that shape both the local and the global. We can choose to make the world safe for capitalism, or we can promote a world where democratic practice and social justice are foregrounded and one in which human movement is at the core of human existence. Thank you. Thank you very much. You actually were ahead of time. So we'll just, I think we will leave the questions for afterwards, if that's okay with you. So we'll introduce, I will introduce the next speaker. And this is Professor um, Peter Donnelly and from the University of Toronto, Kinesiology and Physical Education. And you will speak about the democratization of athletes. The floor is yours. Thank you. One of the things I've noticed about this uh, um, uh, this edition of Play the Game is that uh, athletes are getting mentioned a lot more than uh, than they have at previous uh, Play the Game conferences, and uh, and I, I appreciate that, and I feel that like I uh, I will embellish that to today. Um, is it this? Yes. To. In 2000, Sunday Cotwala said, it's difficult to find anything else in the world quite so badly governed as sports. And just to summarize how bad that governance is, uh, the organizational problems are, the lack of representation and democratization, um, and the corruption problems and lack of transparency. I mean, that pretty much summarizes everything that uh, Play the Game is interested in interested in. But this has real consequences, and the consequences include uh, the integrity problems that we've heard about here, the problems with athlete health, safety, violence control, uh, problems with labor relations and due process that are consistent um, um, throughout sport, professional and non-professional, and problems of athlete maltreatment, child protection. Those are just a few examples of the, of the real consequences of having a, a, a malgoverned system of sport. So what's the problem here? The problem is athletes who are not able to determine the form and the circumstances of their participation. Uh, when they participate, where, how often, all of those kinds of things. And um, there's a lot of very smart people here, and a lot of academics have been looking at this for a long time, a lot of athletes have recognized uh, the problems, and nobody has been quite able to, to break into this iron cage that, uh, that top athletes find themselves in. We understand the why relatively well, we don't understand the how in terms of changing it. Um, so the why is precarious employment, uh, each game may be your last, each, uh, each event may be the last time you compete, uh, lack of organization bar, um, among players, uh, control is ceded to others through the establishment of a, a really powerful culture of control in, in, in sports. And within that culture, there's a normalization of authoritarian styles of leadership and management. It wasn't always like that. Um, one of Denmark's uh, best exports to Canada was Jan Eisenhardt. And Jan uh, um, played for, um, I'm not sure how many people know, he played for Marseille Olympique in the 1920s. And as a player for Marseille Olympic, he was able to, uh, to sell his service to Marseille and leave whenever he felt like it. So uh, he was not under any kind of binding contract. And the journeyman player who were able to move from team to team when they received a better offer uh, in terms of, uh, of benefits or, or finances, um, the, uh, uh, when they wanted to play in a particular city rather than another city because of their family relationships or whatever, they were able to do that on a much more free basis in certainly in North America in the, in the 1920s and the 1930s. 
Um, we see another relationship. Uh, those of you who have seen the film Chariots of Fire realize that uh, coaches were, were hired by athletes who could afford them. Uh, and so the coaches worked for the athletes rather than uh, the other way around that has come these days. We very often think of tennis and golf as sports where there is still this capacity to, uh, to play where and when you like, and yet both tennis and, and golf professionals have complained in recent years about the increasing demands uh, and the, the mandatory number of tournaments that they have to play. So even in those freelance kind of sports, um, the controls are, uh, are being imposed in, in much more serious ways. So, shifting from that freelance uh, status towards this control, culture of control, uh, various types of reserve clauses were put into place. I know in, in ice hockey in Canada, um, as soon as you joined an organized team as a, as a young boy, you were already you already belonged to the Chicago Blackhawks or the Montreal Canadiens just by reason of playing for a particular team. Militaristic styles of coaching came into play. Um, uh, binding contracts were imposed on players. Work continued to be precarious, making uh, any kind of action by players difficult. And pro athletes were became commodities. They were bought, they were sold, they were traded, they were drafted. Um, you know, the only other population that I can think of that that happens to is slaves. So, uh, you know, uh, while they might be very well paid slaves, they are still enslaved. This authoritarian style of, uh, of um, leadership in sports filters down to the lowest levels and young athletes are enculturated quite early into authoritarian systems and accepting authoritarian systems. And I heard a paper by Dr. Ellison from Sweden, on, from Norway, I should say, on this precisely this issue in, uh, in May. So what are the consequences? As Hans Breining said at the, uh, at the Cologne uh, Play the Game conference, sport doesn't is detached from the normal rules and regulations of society. This autonomy of sport gives it a pass, gives it an exemption. Athletes enjoy fewer human rights than other citizens. Pro athletes are exempt from rights that protect employees in other settings, the right to choose where you work, for example, and they're exempt from workplace health and safety regulations that affect uh, employees in, in, other, in other settings. Non-professional athletes, and this is the case of the Canadian national team, they may have contracts with Sport Canada, the government, the government through Sport Canada, with the Canadian Olympic Committee, and possibly with, uh, with sponsors, but the government of Canada denies them status as employees so that they don't enjoy any of the rights that other employees, employees enjoy. We give you an example of the. the we uh, we talked recently to one of Canada's top athletes, and she showed us her contracts. And between us, she mostly identified um, the rights that she didn't enjoy uh, as one of Canada's top athletes: right to free speech and expression, right to privacy, right you know for whereabouts or whatever, right to health privacy. Um, everybody on the sport organization would get to know about, uh, about your health status. Dignity and ownership of representation, that is control of your image, the inability to control how your image is used by the sport organization, by the Canadian Olympic Committee, by the IOC. Um, the right to make a living uh, because of your uh, commitments to sport. The clarity of your contractual obligations, uh, n not really clear. And due process when pe penalized for social media uh, errors. And just to show you what the, the restrictions are with, in terms of social media, these are IOC regulations with regard to tweeting and using Facebook and, and such like. And the Canadian Olympic Committee, US Olympic Committee, um, makes the same regulations for, for their athletes. They encourage accredited athletes to post to social media, but they have to be in first-person diary-style format. 
You can't take on the role of a journalist, you can't report on competition, you can't disclose information about people or your organization or other organizations, and you can't be rude. So, uh, you know, there are, it, there's not much freedom of expression in there. When we've talked to athletes about this situation, some have clearly drunk the Kool-Aid. They're completely obedient and accepting of the system in which they find themselves. Uh, and I call this for one particular student uh, who, was a, who was a leading athlete. Um, I began to refer this to the Stockholm system because when I was going on one of my rants about uh, the, uh, um, the problems with authoritarian coaching, she said, uh, how, uh, how is the coach ever going to get you to do what uh, he wants you to do without this style of coaching? How would that be possible if the coach couldn't punish you? And so I just sit back and I say, uh, excuse me, there are whole sports such as Ultimate and Roller Derby that are run by athletes who hire coaches if they need them. Uh, and there are incredibly self-motivated young people who've reached enormously high levels of skill in BMX biking and uh, roller, roller skating and, uh, and uh, roller, uh, skateboarding and those kinds of sports without ever having anybody yell at them or punish them except to say you stop doing what you're doing. So, and they've never had a coach. They're, they're self-taught and taught in, in peer groups. So most of the athletes that we've talked to have concerns to a greater or lesser extent about their status and rights as an athlete, or an elite or a professional athlete, but they're struggling to know what to do about it. Uh, that got distorted. The game belongs to those who play was a reference to children, but I think this should apply to all athletes. And there was a very famous strike in the National Football League in the United States in 1982, where the Players Association distributed a booklet to all of the players. And the main thing that they were striking over was um, how much of the gross revenue of the National Football League should be devoted to players' salaries. And they were asking for 55%. So the book had said, why a, percentage of the, uh, why a percentage of the gross? Because we are the game. And this is the main point. Over 30 years later, there's an NFL player here uh, saying, why can't we have some say in the rule changes? Uh, you know, we don't even have a representative on the rule change committee. So, unrepresented, undemocratized, I'm moving fast now because I want to get to my conclusion in the last minute. Um, anemic player associations and unions, non-pro athletes almost entirely without representation, only when there is a, uh, a grievance um, that they are prepared to come forward with. And I think a key point here is that it's not a privilege to play if other, other people are making money from your uh, participation. There are some examples from uh, Thibaut from Kadwala um, that I can share with you that um, suggest that any policy or rule changes that occur have to be taken to the athletes or representative of the athletes for their approval and uh, this would be appropriate, an appropriate form of governance. But perhaps most uh, prominently here. Nobody owns sport. Sport is a cultural commons and the international federations or the sport executives, they're the executives. They're the stewards of sport. They're the trustees that are entrusted by the players, their families and the fans with the governance of activity that anyone may play without reference to these people. In pro sports, owners may own a team, they may own a stadium, but they don't own the players, despite what they think, and they do not own the sport. Solutions. There's a two-pronged approach to solutions that we need to keep in mind. One is, we keep doing what Play the Game is doing, and a lot of us are doing uh, separate from Play the Game. That's investigating, naming, shaming all violations, and using new technologies to promote 
all of the evidence we find about that. And secondly, we need to find a way to support athletes in terms of solidarity and collective action. Athletes are the precariat of sports, and anything that happens in sports needs to be consulted with the athletes. They're the only experts who really matter. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now we quickly move on to the next speaker, which is a colleague of mine. Uh, where is he? Oh, over there. Mr. Paul Broberg from the Danish uh, Olympic Committee and the Sports Confederation. And he just recently, or it's quite new actually, uh, made a global sports political power index, which we are about to hear about now. Here you go. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, this has been uh, published today um, in uh, one of the Danish uh, newspapers, where we have uh, tried to see if we could uh, map and identify the most influential countries when it comes to international sports policy. And why, why, have we, why is the National Olympic Committee trying to do that? Well, first of all, we would like to have a rough overview of uh, how influential is Danish sport in Europe and in, in the international sports world in order for us to see if we could navigate a bit more uh, when it comes to, to our official goals of getting more Danish uh, leaders elected to international positions. Um, of course it was in interesting for us also when we started that, that, that work to see, okay, let us map all the uh, na nations actually. So we actually get a, an index of, uh, of who is actually sitting on the most influential positions in, in sport, both European-wise and internationally-wise. Um, and finally, we could actually see this as an instrument for us to be a bit better in going into the discussions taking place here, play the game and in other forums about, I mean, how are we uh, making solutions for the international sports when it comes to good governance, when it comes to uh, the fight against match fixing, doping, our challenges when it comes to engage people in, in, in physical activity and things like that. What did we do? Well, we took all the executive boards of the Olympic Sports Federations. We took all the Olympic, all the boards of the members of the uh, Association of IOC recognized international sports federations. And in order to use this in a national uh, framework as well, we needed to go through the international representation of the 61 uh, member federations that we have in Denmark that are not included in both the Olympic Sports Federation and in our briefs. Of course, this is a, can be a challenging work because it, it is not always clear who is actually a member of the executive committee when you look at that. Uh, it, it's not always clear who, who had the right to vote because if you want to have influence, of course, you should have the right to vote. Um, so, roughly, we of course we have tried to, to identify those uh, challenges, but uh, I can't guarantee you that the uh, mistakes have slipped into to this uh, to this. Uh, line of, of work, uh, but when we, when we tried to do, it, to do it, we actually had this in mind. We also tried to, to weight the, the organizations in order to recognize that some are more influential and are more interesting for Danish sport to be a member of than others. And of course you can discuss such a weighting until the sun goes down. Uh, we started by, by having, okay, the country that is holding the president of the IOC is getting 10 points, uh, Germany now and uh, all the way down to see if this is working. We said, well, if you're a member of a European non-Olympic federation, just a member of the executive committee, you get one point. And of course, then we can discuss this. Uh, we also took out FIFA and UEFA, as, uh, for, because football generally is uh, a very big sport and, and have a lot of influence in international sports uh, policy. You could have taken out other of the mm, very big federations, uh, athletics or, uh, or swimming, we, uh, we uh, admit that, and that could be interesting in looking into details about about that. What was the weight? What was the criteria for our weighting? Well, we said there's a clearly uh, difference if you are an Olympic sport or non-Olympic sport. Um, we looked at the financial strength of the organization. We looked at uh, the interest of the organization from medias. We looked at the number of athletes that the organization is uh, organizing, and uh, finally we looked at. Um, Again, from, a, from our perspective, 
what, what kind of political influence uh, do these organizations have on the national decision makers and international decision makers? So, 30, 31 international Olympic federations are mapped, 45 international non-Olympic federations, 25 European uh, Olympic, 15 non-Olympic, and then of course also the IOC, the IOC executive board, the EUC, and ANAC. So that makes it all 119 executive committees that have been mapped. And that gives, that gives a total of amount of position of 1,634 when it comes to international uh, positions. Uh, points, the, the number of points you could get here was 6,836. So if one country is actually in all positions in all of the world, it would give, uh, you would have uh, that number of points. And of course the other is, uh, is uh, if you just uh, put on the international positions altogether, one is, one, is more than 1,000. And here we have Europe. So summed up in our in the way that we've done this, uh, we see that the Great Britain is is the one that's coming out having the most uh, influence on European sports policy. What we find most interesting is actually you can see the five most influential is what you can call the old European countries. So uh, people talking about the, the the Eastern European mafia, you know, riding through uh, the international or the European sports uh, world. Well, Russia is is climbing, is here, and of course. Uh, is having a lot of influence, but then they are spreading down the, the, the former uh, or the Eastern European countries. Um, and of course, from a national perspective, we are more than satisfied with being uh, at, a, at a number 12th place. Um, we also try to say, okay, if, if we do points uh, per million of citizens, when, 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 how does the list uh, look uh, then? And uh, there we suddenly have Switzerland. Uh, in, in, in that list as the most influential country, uh, while Denmark is scoring very high as well. But doing this, you know, it, it's, it's like when you do the Olympic medal table also compared to, to inhabitants, you, you get a totally different uh, picture. But here, when we're talking about influence, you, I think we should be care, we should, we should, we should not uh, overestimate the, this ranking because it, it doesn't come into it to uh, actual real influence. The international situation is that the uh, United States is actually by far scoring most points uh, <coughs> when it comes to international influence. And here again, it's, it's for us kind of interesting to see Europe is really, really well placed in, the, in this list. It's also very interesting to see that um, you, can, you can talk about Russia being a democracy or not, but, but, but you're going down to China at the 10th place before you actually start to see some clearly autocratic uh, countries to be uh, to, to come on the list. And, and then uh, Egypt uh, having some troubles as well, even though they're, they're, they're trying to do something. Um, but when you look at this list, you can actually see that we have countries with a more or less established democratic culture that are, that are having the most influence influence on, on the international uh, um, sports policy. Denmark is uh, number 36, and of course that's quite interesting for us also, I'll come back to that. If you, if you just go to the non-European uh, countries, again, it's quite interesting to see at the list of 10, you will only see uh, China, Egypt, that are, that are really having troubles with, uh, with democracy. And then we can, of, of course, we can discuss Argentina and Brazil and, 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 and others, if, if we like the way that they have developed their demo democratic model. But, I mean, coming to conclusions here, it seems also that the non-European countries are democratically based countries that are having the most influence. So, conclusions. Well, from a national perspective, Denmark has a strong political influence in Europe, while we have troubles when it comes to, or challenges when it comes to the international uh, world. And what is interesting for us there as a national organization is that a lot of the solutions that are needed to be made in sport are international. And therefore, of course, if we want to you know, have influence on that agenda, we need to look at getting more international positions. Europe is fine, but we need to get more, have a look at see, can we get more international positions. I think, or we think, that Great Britain's influence, both at a European level and international level, shows that strategically it can pay, it pays off if you work with this strategically. That you actually go into uh, and having uh, what, what UK sport is doing in England, advising 
their candidates on how that they how they should navigate in the international environment are doing education so you are better equipping uh, future international politicians in how they can react when they are elected is actually paying off and, and Britain is now a very influential uh, country. Um, and, and then we must uh, conclude that, that the leaders from democratically advanced countries are having by far the most power in international sports uh, organizations. But that leads me to what, to what to do in the future then? Because from a national point of view again, we need to have a, a look to see if Denmark can, can, uh, can get more international leaders elected. Uh, but I think we need some discussions also if we can make broader alliances across the global uh, world instead of, uh, of just talking to the ones that we that, that, that you know look like ourselves at most because I, I think we have some troubles by I mean when so many democracy or people from coming from democrat, democratic cultures are, are, are represented in international sports organizations maybe they should start, start to talk a bit together. So the Japanese are actually talking to the Danes. Uh, the Americans are talking to uh, are talking to to uh, to, to, uh, to people from from, uh, from Poland. In order to make broader alliances, I think we're still in the old alliances. Western Europe, Western Europe are talking together. Eastern Europe are talking together. Asian countries are talking together. But if we really want to change this, maybe we should we need more uh, more uh, broader alliances. And then I think a discussion that is. Uh, Actually, I think we miss that sometimes. Also, you have to play the game. How can we empower these politicians uh, so they have resources to be democratic and to be transparent and to be accountable? Because, well, they are from countries where this is, I mean, a normal way of, of, of behaving when you enter into, to, into politics. So we need that transformed to an international level. So further discussions, my last slide. Well, we need more research on how we can uh, take advantage of the possibilities for democratic reforms when the majority of the elected leaders are from democratic, democratic cultures. That, that's a discussion. We actually also need to go into a little more deeper into see are, are the leaders that we are elected, are they democratic outliers? Are they the last dictators of the democracies that are going into sport because they, 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 they can uh, exercise their habits of... of, of uh, of, of, of you know uh, deciding everything, or are they actually coming out of a bad culture in the national sports organizations? So is is the is the challenge all really starting at a national level, when they are not you know used to uh, govern very democratically? And uh, of course, finally, we would uh, need to to repeat this mapping, and we're going to do that in, uh, in 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 a couple of years' time to see. How is the, the more long-term development when it comes to identify the most influential countries in international sports policy? Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. And now the next speaker. I'm very happy to present. <laughs> um, let me see, I need my glasses now. Uh, Ezekiel Fernandez Morris from a columnist from La Nation. A columnist. A no. Columnist. Ah, a columnist. A columnist. <laughs> I'm sorry for my pronunciation. I was frightened. <laughs> and you too. <laughs> I'll leave the money to you. <laughs> okay, I'll leave the floor to you. <laughs> Good evening, all. Um, this is Jens' idea, Jens Heger Andersen's idea. He was in Buenos Aires last September. Uh, you run it, it, can, it can, yes. It will have no sounds, it's an official video of Buenos Aires. But Jens Heger Andersen was in Buenos Aires last September in the meeting of the IOC. He saw a new Olympic power in Argentina, and so he told me, Ezekiel, I want you to speak about this, so here I am. Uh, I will begin with a very difficult question for all of you, considering that the Congress is finishing after more than 100 speakers, after doping, mega events, corruption. The question is, does anybody here know how many gold medals Phelps won? How? How much? No. Gold medals in the three Olympic Games. 
man. 18. 18. Okay. And now I have a second and more difficult question. Considering also 100 speakers, the party is very near, uh, Jen's accident in his gymnastic. Considering also FIFA's yesterday solidarity for Guantanamo, Lampedusa, etc., etc. The question is, does anybody know here how many gold medals Argentina won in his whole Olympic history? The same as Michael Phelps. <laughs> yes, Michael Phelps, of course, uh, competed alone. Argentina needed 88 years, 20 Olympic Games, and 2,244 athletes. <laughs> and the third question is, so how become an Argent Argentina an Olympic center of power? <laughs> I will try to tell you, to tell you the answer and advice. Uh, this is not a corruption story. Huh? Uh, but, uh, sorry, not, not correct you here, but as philosopher Walter de Gregorio told us yesterday, which is the line? Uh, where, where does sports finish and where does business begin? It is more sophisticated. Uh, the, 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 excuse me, the nostalgics here in the room, but not always the past was better. Uh, the main responsible for this Argentina's Olympic sports situation was Colonel Antonio Rodriguez. And besides that poor performance, Colonel lasted for 28 years as president of our Olympic Committee. He started in 1977 during the bloodiest dictatorship that Argentina has suffered, and he finished in 2005, 22 years after democracy was restored. Today, the new president of Argentina's Olympic Committee represents another type of power, economic power. His name is Gerardo Verten. He is the head of the Verten Group, one of the most powerful holdings in the country. And listen now to this meteoric career. Graduated as a veterinarian and a second level jumper, Verde is the president of the Argentine Equestrian Federation since 2003. In 2009, he became president of the Argentine Olympic Committee. 2011, just two years later, and coming from that little federation, he was made a member, uh, sorry, 2009, yes, Argentine president, and 2011, just two years after, he was made a member of the International Olympic Committee. That's not all. Last July, he was able to get Buenos Aires chosen as the seat of the Youth Games, 2018 Youth Games. And in September, Vertain was the host of the historic Olympic Assembly that took place in Buenos Aires. His friend Thomas Bach was chosen as the new Olympic president and Tokyo was elected to be the seat of the Olympic Games in 2020. Last year, Vertain traveled eight times to Lausanne, to the heart of the IOC, in his personal plane, of course. Every year, he also paid a visit to the house of Kuwaiti Sheikh Ahmed al Faha al Sabah, who today seems to be the most powerful member of the IOC. Thanks to al Sabah, Vertain was declared last year an illustrious visitor to the business network of the Arab League. Vertain has a lot of VIP friends, all of them guests at El Capricho, El Capricho. The Wim is a stud farm in Capilla del Señor in the province of Buenos Aires. Princess Aya of Jordan, King Juan Carlos I, and Infanta Pilar of Spain, Athena Onassis, politicians, Argentine celebrities, 
members of the jet set, all of them were there. Nonetheless, his top guest in Buenos Aires was Bill Clinton. The former US president attended in 2012 the marriage of Bertin's son Gregorio at the local Sheraton Hotel. It was a sushi and champagne party animated by musician Pitbull. As strange as it sounds, Gerardo Bertin was, in his youth, a member of the Communist Party of Argentina. Bertin's first Olympic appearance was as head of the Argentine equestrian team at the Games in Sydney 2000. Seven members of the Bertens clan somehow competed in Sydney. One of his sons and a new foot riders, his wife, sons and daughter-in-law, owners of horses. His own growth for the Beijing Games was swift. He appeared three times per day in a major national cable news TV channel as Argentina team leader, right beside the athletes. Everything the channel, the athletes, and even the Olympic Village was sponsored by Telecom, the Bertain Group's flagship company. Our Olympic president brought some medals plus another good business from Beijing. He sold his shares of the Standard Bank to the Chinese ICBC. Land, finance, and insurance are other great assets of his clan. So, how far will he go? His next goal, my sources said, is to end the reign of Mario Vázquez Raña, the Mexican who has been the president of the Pan-American Sports Organization, PASO, since 1975. Vázquez Raña is 81 years old and he's very angry. In 2012, al fired him, first from his 32-year presidency of the Association of National Olympic Committees, ANOC, and then from his office at Olympic Solidarity. Vasquez Rania, who then resigned as executive committee member of the IOC, took revenge on his own territory. He helped Lima to beat the Argentine city of La Punta as the designated host of the 2019 Pan American Games. Vertain missed Al Sabah during that election. The Kuwaiti Sheikh had been instrumental, instrumental in Lausanne for Buenos Aires to be chosen to host the Youth Games of 2018 instead of the favorite city, Medellin. The Youth Games really seemed to give, to give an equal importance to its educational, social, and cultural functions compared with the actual sports competition. This is ideal for Argentina, a country nowadays respected around the world for its human rights politics. The Youth Games would be a return to the old idea of Coubertin. Perhaps that is, that is why Bertin recalled that Argentina was the only Latin American member of the 12 countries that founded the IOC on June 23, 1894 in Paris. That inclusion was thanks to José Benjamín Subiaur, an Argentine who shared Coubertin's enthusiasm for sports as an educational tool. Subiaur was a progressive scholar with no personal fortune that he could use to attend the meetings of the IOC. He was the first member cast out of the Olympism. He was replaced in 1907 with Manuel Quintana, a member, he, he really was a member of the Argentine elite. But Quintana did worse. Argentina held in 1910 the so-called Centennial Games to celebrate the centennial anniversary of the founding of the country. And Coubertin, jealous of his toy, did not like the fact that Argentina had used the word games without authorization. Quintana was kicked out the same year. The first two members expelled from the IOC were Argentinians. <laughs> the third one, the third one, uh, many years later, was the American Ernest Lee Yanke. His fault, he opposed to celebrate Berlin Games. 
the Nazi games. Argentine athletes, to speak frankly, are extremely happy now with Verdain. The businessman raised more money than anyone before for their training. This is thanks to the ENARD, a mixed organization created to get more money for the athletes. The ENARD had the benefit of a tax on cell phone use approved in 2009 by a large majority of the Argentine Congress. Who is the powerful man in the ENARD? Mr. Verdain, of course. A lawmaker who opposed the tax described Verdain's curious personal position. On one hand, as the tax collector in his role as CEO of Telecom, and on the other hand, as the tax beneficiary in his Olympic leader role. Last September, a few days before Bach's coronation in Buenos Aires, a German TV documentary showed how his growth as an Olympic leader has been going hand in hand with his growth in the world of business. That's the world of Verten. If you want to go higher, stronger, faster, feed yourself to your 40s. Don't choose an Olympic medalist as president of your National Olympic Committee. Just follow the route of the money. Thank you. Not economist, but columnist. <laughs> okay, we'll quickly move on to the next speaker. And you will speak about the doom loop of intercollegiate athletics and its parallels to the IOC and FIFA. Please welcome Benjamin Bendridge, yeah. PhD student from the George August August or University of Göttingen. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I want to welcome you all to this presentation, the Doom Group of Intercollegiate Athletics and its parallels to the IOC and FIFA. Um, over the last five years, I've conducted research regarding the support of student athletes. I was especially interested in the American college system and its wide range of current problems. The goal is to learn from the mistakes and be able to, in order to develop a new model for student athletes in Germany. Over the last four years, I've been to several athletic powerhouses in the US, the University of Oregon, the University of Texas, and the University of Arizona. For this presentation, I've decided to give a quick overview of the current developments of the NCAA and possible similarities to global sports players. College athletics is rooted in the classical idea of juvenile's classical idea of men sound and corporate sano, a sound mind and a sound body. But over the last decades, college athletics has grown to be a complex and often controversial aspect of higher education. The competitiveness of colleges in regards to athletics has established a multi-billion dollar industry. Besides all the attention and hype, also scrutiny and stereotypes come with it, and often label student athletes as dumb jocks, although they shouldn't get the blame for the current developments. Today, universities and coaches and big corporations are the profiteers of an NCAA power structure. This system is based on two mythical principles. First, amateurism, and second, student athletes. So, if we look at the principle, the bylaw 2.9, the principle of amateurism, student athletes shall be amateurs in intercollegiate sports, and their participation should be motivated primarily by education, and by physical, mental, and social benefits to be derived. Student participation in intercollegiate athletics is an avocation and student athletes should be protected from exploitation by professional and commercial enterprises. So this bylaw defines college sports as an activity taken up in addition to one's study, usually for enjoyment, a hobby, distraction or diversion. But today, it's more than that. Current sc scandals tell a different story. Last week, the NCAA announced the penalty for the University of Miami. It will lose nine scholarships over the next three years, but is still allowed to participate in the bowl games, the championship games. This sentence came after a lengthy probe of the, uh, the relationship of the school with a former booster. The NCAA was investigating allegations that the booster had given millions of dollars 
to more than 70 Hurricane football players over eight years. So what does it say about the NCAA and that it took two and a half years to hand out this mild penalty? Also a few weeks back, the Sports Illustrated broke the story about the fast-rising Oklahoma State football team. The special feature of this scandal was that it had it all. Oklahoma State paid its player, players money, academic fraud took place, ignored the usage of drugs, and organized, uh, and organized sex dates for possible recruits for future athletes. So big time college sports. It's really about athletic powerhouses like Texas, Florida, Michigan, or Penn State. Each earn between 40 to 80 million dollars in profits each year with their football team. <laughs> even after paying their uh, coaches multi-billion dollar salaries. Universities exploit young athletes. Star high school players often get under the table payments. Extraordin extraordinary measures are taken to keep academically incompetent athletes eligible for competition. Student athletes in high profile sports graduate on a much lower level. So especially in football, basketball, baseball, and sometimes ice hockey, the problems are significant. But even low profile sports gets more and more commercialized. The NCAA's power grew along with the television revenues. In 19, 1984, the NCAA versus the Board of Regents of the University of Oklahoma decision changed the game. Overnight, the NCAA lost the control of the television market for football, and new TV stations were able to come up, like we know of uh, today, Notre Dame TV channel or Longhorn Network. But still, and the NCAA is making the money out of still controlling the basketball tournament. Um, Revenue-wise, um, colleges are big, big players, but most of them are not making a profit. So in 2010, only 22 out of 120 football bowl subdivision schools make money out of athletics. Contrary to that, the 12 executive members of the NCAA earn a decent amount of money. President Emmert alone earns two million a year and his fellow executive members $400,000 a year. The NCAA itself signed 40 licensee contract agreements with big corporations like EA Sports and Nike. So for the NCAA itself, so the NCAA itself generates millions of dollars by selling videos or video games, but also individual schools like the world-famous University of California, Berkeley, signed over 100 corporate sponsorship deals, only for athletics. Still, most of these schools make a deficit. Now, another example would be the Ohio State, also all of the promotional rights to the international sports market here at IMG College. And the other example is the contract with ESPN and Longhorn Network of the University of Texas of Austin, who brings the university $11 million a year. If we now look, according to the statistics of the USA Today, a grand total of seven public schools nationwide operate without receiving subsidies from the school or state. The ranks of the highest paid active public employee include including 27 football coaches, 13 basketball coaches, and one hockey coach. So are these tax, uh, tax dollars paying these coaches? Not directly. But the problem is that academic departments at 99 major schools lost an average of 5 million. Once you take out the revenue that is generated by um, university subsidies or by student fees. That means that often the students and the universities cover the costs of their athletic departments. Whether these subsidies go directly into the salaries is questionable, but without this inf information, it seems at least fair to question these high salaries for employees affiliated with major public schools. In, in order to secure the reputation of the association, so I'm talking about the NCAA, from the mid of the century, academic reform took place, again and again. Nearly every decade, one major academic reform was passed, always with, a, always with different and contrary effects. Although academic performance does play a major role nowadays, the problems aren't solved. 
Rather, it seems like the NCAA and its members commit the same mistakes over and over again. So, historically, you can really talk about the doom loops of intercollegiate athletics. Over the last hundred years, the NCAA has often reacted in similar ways to problems of academic fraud or other scandals. It possibly starts with a scandal. During the scandals, most of the time athletes get exploited and you can see breaches of law. Then the, pu the general public is informed and you can recognize a short and often intensive public outcry as well as bad publicity for the NCAA and the member university which is involved. The NCAA tries to protect its system by reacting to such events in similar ways. They bring new rules and bylaws. In several cases, de these reforms were even, even had the chance to change intercollegiate for the better, I would say. But most of them, most of the cases, rules and scandals, uh, or rules and bylaws get revised and extremely weakened. The consequence is new scandals and fraud take place, and after and after these become public, once again rock the boat. Athletic departments seem uncheckable, and especially president and faculty seem weak and powerless. The only logical consequence, and only possible cycle breaker, seems to be the law. Only current and future lawsuits will have the chance to change the NCAA for the better, or college athletics for the better. Now, so is is the NCAA a global player in, sport, in, the, in the sports world? Are there similarities to international powerhouses? First we look at the TV contracts. The CBS Sports and Turner Broadcasting paid $771 million to the NCAA for television rights for the 2011 men's basketball tournament alone. That's three, three quarters of a billion on the backs of amateurs. So financially, the NCAA can clearly be compared to the FIFA and IOC. It becomes clear that these associations and federations have a few things in common. All of them nowadays are highly commercialized. The IOC has its roots, like the NCAA, in the noble idea of amateurism. But all of them are highly commercialized, have similar TV contracts, and their goal as an association seems to be the profit. Student athletes uh, give up all of their marketing rights in the beginning of their studies at the university, even after they are done with the university. Something similar we can find uh, during the Olympic Games. Also there, athletes are not allowed to show their private sponsors. So everything is professionalized, so I call it the offshore islands of big-time sports. All of them pay reduced or no state taxes, and they get state subsidies for stadiums. They have the same problems. Gambling, doping, match fixing, bribery. So, so the following issues and terms come up with the American college systems. Are there similarities to the IOC and FIFA? Decide yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very interesting, I think. And I really like that my speakers at this session, they are very on time. All of them, almost all of them. So now we introduce the last one. I hope you are on time also. But we'll... <laughs> Okay, so there will be lots of time for questions. So you have to prepare questions in the audience. Michael mm, McConich, kind of. Okay, three stars, thank you. <laughs> I'm very looking forward to hear your presentation. Manageable sports governance, uh, the, the case of Swiss-based European sports federations. Please welcome Michael. So, my name is Mikhail Murkonic. Uh, I know it's very difficult to say this. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm a PhD candidate at the Swiss Graduate School of Public Administration at the University of Lausanne. And 
basically the idea of this presentation is to show the application of one governance measurement tool that we created together with my supervisor, Professor Van Schaffler, called BIPIS, and extract some indicators of this tool and test the tool on European sports federations that are located in Switzerland. Uh, before I start, I'll tell you that we have nine European sports federations in Switzerland and seven European sports federations are located in Luxembourg. So there is a big concentration in those two countries. Just a few words about good governance. It is a European team since 2000. Uh, in 2000, the European Council publishes the needs declaration in sports, stressing the specificity of sports, but also saying that regarding corruption issues occurred uh, during the Salt Lake City scandal, that sports organizations should act democratically and trans in a transparent manner. After this publication, you have the sports movement that reacts quite uh, rapidly in a conference in Brussels, called the first uh, conference on governance, organized by the European Olympic Committees and the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile. They propose a list um, of uh, governance principles such as transparency, democracy, solidarity, efficiency, <coughs> effectiveness, and other. You have different European public institutions that publish their own principle of governance applicable to sports organizations on the side of the Council of Europe, on the side of the Euro European Commission, via um, one communication on the development of the European dimension of sport, also the white paper in sport, Euro team, European Team Sports Association, UEFA also, talking about democracy, transparency, um, representation, accountability, again the Council of Europe, and also in the framework of the European Commission preparatory actions in the field of sport, different projects that you've certainly heard about, uh, AGIS, uh, Sport for Good Governance, and other ones. And also, uh, lately, the, or the more recent the European Commission Expert Group on Good Governance that published, um, I think, six weeks ago, a list of ten principles of governance that sports organizations should implement or respect. So clearly, good governance has a European reality here. What we I think with manageable sports governance, first we notice that most of the recommendations that are developed on a supranational level of analysis, they apply to a heterogeneous and undefined group of sports organizations. In all the publications, declarations of European institutions, you will always see sports organizations should apply good governance principles. Of course, behind this message you will always have corruption cases uh, within FIFA, or at the beginning of the 2000, the Salt Lake City scandal, some reference to the ISL case. But at the end, when the principles are published, it is also always undefined. There are also many existing governance pro principles. I've already said that there is a European reality on that, but you have also UK sport, Australian sports commissions, in Canada also. In Switzerland also the, the government starts to publish governance principles. Uh, a lot of principles but only few measurement tools at least on an international level. So we created a tool with uh, my supervisor. There you know also about the sports governance observer, also the sport for good governance toolkit and also other ones. So what we think with the manageable sports governance uh, is that we should start with a parsimonious and minimalist approach to governance and propose a smaller set of the BIPTIS indicators. We try to focus on what's uh, existing in the comparative studies and also on corporate governance literature. You would find more and more um, principles and indicators that try to take into account the complexi complexity of the environment. For instance, ECODA, they published discriminated uh, principles and indicator for large companies and smaller companies. So at the end we believe that there should be an absolute minimum required for international or European sports federations. 
briefly the seven dimensions of, of the BIPDIS uh, organizational transparency, reporting transparency, stakeholders representation, innovative process. You can read the other ones. And uh, they are related to more broader themes such as transparency, democracy, accountability, and sports responsibility. Finally, to European sports federations. So, there is a scarce literature on the governance of European sports federations as a group of organizations. We find excellent articles uh, written by Borja Garcia or Matthew Hall from Burbeck uh, on UEFA. Uh, also, my colleague Arnold Gert wrote uh, an excellent article on the relationship between UEFA and in European institutions but very few on a broader set of European sports federations. Um, and also on a practical side, only few of these European sports federations are directly or indirectly consulted by European institutions. It is interesting to say that uh, I've told you about the latest publication of the EU expert group on good governance. The only European sports federation that has been consulted was UEFA. Main features of uh, these federations, degree of institutionalization, so what I mean with that is uh, about the legal autonomy of these European sports federations. So if you take uh, the 35 Olympic sports, uh, according to the 2011 uh, edition of the Olympic Charter, so taking into account baseball and, and softball, only 29 European sports federations have a legal autonomy. In the other cases, the six other cases, they do not exist. For instance, for the International Ice Hockey Federation, it's a subdivision of the International Federation. It has no legal autonomy. Basic information, average year of foundation, 1975. Uh, for international sports federations, it's uh, 1927. Average size of the legislative body, 48 members, so just for one member uh, bigger than the Council of Europe. Average size of the executive body, 14 members. Legal form, all out of the 29 European sports federations are non-profit associations. The last one uh, that chose this status, uh, this legal form, sorry, was the Euro, Eurosaf, the European Sailing uh, Federation, that I think last year was still incorporated under um, it's a, um, under the island man man islands. Uh, ah, man, yes. Thank you. <laughs> So I told you at the beginning, legal distribution, nine are incorporated under Swiss law and are based in, in, in Lausanne or in Basel, in Bern also, in Switzerland. These are Eurosaf, sailing, UAC, uh, cycling, uh, shooting, tennis Europe, softball, baseball, UEFA, gymnastics and European athletics. And seven are under, incorporated under Luxembourg law. So, I will just show you a small picture of the results. Uh, basically, we, we used uh, qualitative analysis, we used ATLAS uh, with a documentary analysis of the statutes, the annual reports, and completed some of the information uh, via interviews. So, for the first indicator on externally audited financial reports, only UEFA and uh, Baseball Confederation publish financial reports. But can we really say that the Baseball Confederation publishes a financial report because it is only a balance sheet, in fact, and taking the information from 2005 <coughs> to 2011? The European Shooting Confederation publishes its preliminary budget and only UEFA provides information on the quality of the financial report. We were talking about uh, athletes' representation uh, at the beginning of this session. European uh, Shooting Confederation and European Athletics have both an athletes' commissions, uh, commission. Sorry, UEFA has no athletes' commission, 
but their interests are represented so indirectly by FIFPRO, uh, you know certainly about, via its cooptation in the UEFA Professional Football Strategy Council. Talking about term limits, all European sports federations have term limits, but then we have to make clear what we are talking about with the term limits. Um, we see substantial differences between the years, so two years to four years, the terms from two to four, the limits, if it's specified or not, fixed or flexible. And um, also to say that the term limits are the same for the president, the vice president and the elected members in all federations, except for the European Shooting Confederation where the terms are not limited for the elected members. Talking about an annual activity report, only UEFA and baseball publish systematically an annual activity report. And very interestingly here, talking about transparency and how you define transparency, in fact European Tennis has an annual report, but he sells it, the organization sells it. So I had to call a couple of times. And the price, I hope that nobody is here from European Tennis, the price for the annual report is 450 euros. We had a special deal because we are an academic institution for 250 euros. But then, it's just to say that when you, when you talk about transparency, make sure that you, de you, you have a clear definition on active or passive transparency. But sometimes you have to activate the organization to get some information and sometimes you have the information directly on the website. The organization has an environmental and social responsibility policy and programs in place. <coughs> Most of the federations do not have such a policy. European Athletics is very active in this domain. They have a green inspiration concept. They use the sustainability sport and event toolkit. I hope I don't make a mistake here. Uh, that applies to the events that they organize and also an internal sustainability charter. And UEFA has ad hoc partnerships notably with the WWF, but has not a proper environmental strategy. Um, the organization has or recognizes an ethics uh, integrity code for its organs, members and staff, including guidelines for receiving giving gifts from two individuals or organizations. Only few federations have an ethics code. Uh, European Athletics has one. Some of the federations rely on the ethics code of the Umbrella Federation, which is the case of the European Shooting Confederation, or the European Union of Gymnastics. I'm sorry to be so fast, but I think yes, excellent. <laughs> so may briefly two two conclusions regarding this uh, short analysis. Um, it shows a complex picture of the governance processes and structures of European sports federations. Even with a limited number of indicators and a limited number of cases, it seems difficult to reduce governance to clear-cut empirical realities. So again, what is a term limit? What is exactly transparency? And we believe that the parsimonious and hierarchized approach to so identifying core or secondary or minimum standards or whatever is a good start for the implementation of governance recommendations. So, again, I just want to say that I prepared this with uh, my supervisor, Professor Jean-Louis Chaplet, but he couldn't be here today, unfortunately. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Now I will uh, ask the presenters to please be seated up here. And then, uh, in just a second, we will... Start. Hopefully, you have questions for the presenters. I think they made very interesting presentations. And the first question is already on the go. And please, when uh, you have the floor, please present yourself and from which organization you are. Mark? Uh, Margaret Talbot, International Council of Sports Science and Physical Education, it's the fall. Um, did you consider the issue of language in, in the term of power? Because the two uh, countries which scored highest were both English-speaking countries, 
and we are aware of how much easier it is for native English speakers to operate in international um, federations and, uh, and occasions. We are aware of that, of course, when we uh, when we look through the the nations and what, what we think about what to do that, with that in the future. Of course, that that's an influence on when we are selecting uh, candidates uh, that we are supporting for their uh, efforts to get elected. We are of course looking at their language skills, and and so if if a, if a Danish sports leader is coming to me and say, I would like to be a member of uh, UEFA. Or FIFA, and he can't, or he or she can't speak any English. Uh, either we should, uh, of course, uh, consider should should we give him or her some courses so they can speak English, or should we actually find someone else who is better suited? Because language is definitely uh, an issue. Um, I was thinking more about the influence that language has on the international influence, stemming from this almost imperial dominance of language. Mm. And uh, we have something different now as we approach Brazil and the Portuguese language uh, within the context of a Spanish-speaking continent, which is interesting in itself. <coughs> but when you look at countries like China, where there is a huge language block with the rest of the world, but I understand that the schools have, have in the last months been told they must speak English, they must teach English. so that. I, I think it's a, a factor that really is very, very important. And, and, and it's not just about how people from non-English speaking countries operate within that relationship, but it's also about the way in which meetings are conducted and people dominate discussion. And I'll stop there. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm certainly, I mean, it's a short answer. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Uh, totally, definitely, and, I, and if you do a more qualitative research, I, I think you should, you know, really look into that to see what, what influence that have of, as you said, the conducting of the meetings and uh, people's oppor uh, opportunity to speak and actually to exercise influence. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. And Casper first. Thank you all. Casper uh, from the Danish Sports Confederation, maybe this goes to Peter and maybe Benjamin as well. Uh, I was wondering, could it be a fantastic idea to collect some uh, data about the satisfied, I mean, uh, the, the living of these athletes, how satisfied they are uh, compared to each other in different activities, maybe compared to the ordinary uh, population? Do we know anything about it? We, we have some uh, survey data, it's not new anymore, but on Canadian national team athletes and um, the majority live below the poverty level in Canada, um, relying on loans and subsidies from parents. Um, uh, they, uh, most of them complain that they didn't enjoy uh, workplace kind of protections and insurance and health care that, uh, that is enjoyed by uh, employees in other areas and yet they were restricted from seeking work uh, during training time and those kinds of things. So uh, um, I don't have any data on, uh, on professional athletes. Uh, um, clearly life is, is very good for the few at the very top but the majority of professional athletes are much further down the scale, and uh, I would probably agree with the uh, with the national team athletes about about their standards of living. Would it be possible to make a Yeah, we we've been talking about it for for some time. Um, it's necessary. There is an athletes organization, a national team athletes organization in Canada called Athletes Can. Um, they were quite progressive during the 1980s, probably into the 1990s when this survey was carried out. Uh, they've shifted much more towards marketing and post-athletic career training and those kinds of issues now. Um, but I think there may be some, uh, 
some more progressive elements that uh, would enable us to uh, to survey the uh, the membership of Athens Can, and we would like to do that. Thanks. Yeah, I think, and um, I just know for Germany that we had a study in 2010 by Breuer and Haumann, and they found out probably most of the, the same thing for uh, German lead sports. So most of the uh, um, athletes live in poverty, so a large number, so they have the same problems, and especially student athletes have uh, real problems yeah, with money-wise. Money -wise. Paul as former elite athlete, thank you all so much for your contributions. I felt quite warm inside. Especially I want to thank Peter. And I got a question in your direction. You said uh, the new uh, elite sportsman is a commodity. It's become a commodity. After you started with what is left of sports when sporters are out and the game belongs to those who play, etc. And you said they are slaves. Um, nowadays, I call my former colleagues the new gladiators. <laughs> because uh, if they are eaten by lions, the cameras are warned first, and uh, if the, the cheater, the doper, uh, is put out of the bus by the police, the cameras are turning already. Um, I think you are you're right, most of the lead sportsmen are poor and are to be used in a way, but some of them are bought as a commodity and are more like shares, in fact, for the shareholders. And when they don't grow in worth, we throw them away. Um, so it's, it's, it's particular to see that the position of the elite sportsman is in one way more commodity, more slave, etc. But we see Walter Palmer, who succeeded in the last five years to organize an elite sports union of more than 100,000 participants, acknowledged by the United Nations, getting more internationally organized, while at the same time, for Holland, for instance, but not only Holland, look at the Olympics, look at... If an athlete has won his race or her race, the first thing that happens is draped in a national flag. So nationalism has overtaken the internationalism, which was originally the Olympics. I always say, and my neighbor, Crit knows his former uh, DDR. This was what we all criticized before the Iron Curtain. This extreme nationalism, sports for your nation. That is what all Western countries are doing now. I mean, it's disgusting in a way. But I'm very positive on the other hand, because of these strong athlete uh, unions who are emerging. And how do you see, Peter, your, <laughs> uh, how do you make something out of it? These, these tendencies, these processes of internationalism, of the media exposure, the nationalism uh, imposed on sportsmen, that are all, all uh, opponent uh, uh, development, developments. How, how, Will, will you will you shine your light on that? I I get puzzled. Okay. Me too. <laughs> yeah, me too. It, it's um, it's particularly puzzling. Um, the uh, perhaps one of the more interesting uh, um, things that is happening is the uh, is the multiple nationalities of many athletes these days and their ability to select the country for which uh, they participate, which very often gives them some freedom and some uh, additional uh, rewards uh, to, to do that. And I think as the uh, 
those characteristics of citizenship become more flexible in some countries and some places um, <coughs> promotes more of an internationalism and a recognition that an athlete is uh, a, a Saudi Norwegian or you know, some, something like that. So, uh, so I think that that's one one little clue, but I think it. Um, the whole global sporting arms race is dictated on the basis of uh, of uh, fetishizing the medal and uh, and just uh, national governments putting more and more money into uh, uh, in, into attempting to move up the medals table, uh, um, which costs more and more every year. And I don't see an end to that yet. Uh, but, uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not optimistic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dieter Soft. I'm from the Danish Inst Institute for Sports Studies. I have a question for Paul, and maybe a comment from Ezekiel afterwards. It's because you are actually talking both about alliances, and I think that's pretty interesting because you had, have different definitions of alliances. You were talking about getting more international posts in sport policy and making global alliances would be a good way. You were talking about the sport family and alliances Al-Shabaab was mentioned. So Paul, the question is, how do you define alliance? And with that in mind, what's the price for a higher ranking? How do you define alliances? Well, here it's uh, really uh, well quite narrow. <laughs> Because for us, it's just been, you know, to be part of a discussion to see could we actually, you know, what we're talking about here, could we get the international sports organizations more democratically uh, focused, uh, transparency, accountability, and all that. And and for me, it's it's it's, it's pure. It's it's aligned about these uh, themes uh, because again, if if we see what countries that are actually having the influence, the, the elected should be known from their life in, their, in, in, in these countries to, to, to how do you act in, how do you act in a, in a democratic uh, culture but we, we can't see that always when, when they are elected into the international positions so for me it's, it's about it's about uh, looking at, uh, at countries uh, where we can find some similarities in the understandings of uh, good governance uh, transparency and, and accountability Yes, I'm not sure how to, to define it. Once I read uh, uh, what nice were that old, day, old days uh, when the Olympic Games were USA against uh, Soviet Union, comparing with these days when the battle is Nike against Adidas. No, um, I, I think the, the, the root of the money make the alliance uh, uh, in my. Exposition. I talk because of the root of the money. Because Argentina has no presence in Olympic nowadays, but the money is a powerful money, a powerful business, and that's the alliance. Uh, in I heard your exposition when Grandona. Uh, we have the, in the FIFA. We have a, the the second high official, senior senior vice president of FIFA, is an Argentinian, and he doesn't speak a word of English, uh, he has no internet, uh, really, he has no email address. Uh, uh, he, he, he doesn't speak English, but you know, he speaks the language of football. Uh, uh, and that's the main uh, language in, in FIFA, I think, uh, in some issues, because a blatter, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, a strange person in the, in the football. He was an executive in, in Swiss uh, companies, uh, not a football man. Uh, Grandona was uh, a player, was practically a trainer. He, was, he found a club, a club. Uh, he was president of the National Association. He makes step by step. Um, and, and he knows the, the, the main the main law of these corporations, sports corporations, 
uh, I, I am speaking uh, ironically, ironically because I am speaking about the mafia and he knows the, the omerta the, and the loyalty. He, in 2001, uh, European Federation said to Grandona, Amen, we are trying to expel Blatter. We have denounced, we denounced Blatter to the Swiss courts. Uh, uh, do you want to be the president, interim president of the FIFA? Without speaking a word of English, without internet, you want to be the president of FIFA uh, in time? And he said no. He was loyal to Blatter. That's why he's now there. Um, and, and why Grondona is there? Maradona is the reason. It's not Grondona. Maradona won a World Cup. Argentina was the king of the football. Uh, we said in, in Argentina, we have a phrase it is uh, the football, uh, football is a sport. Uh, that was played for the first time in England, okay, but was founded in Argentina. <laughs> and, and Maradona won the World Cup and Grondona is there. I, I think I owe you an answer of what, what is the cost of moving up the ranks. And I think we will see uh, two kinds of costs. We will still see uh, the ones that can be bought and uh, with money and uh, different services and uh, promises and things like that. But uh, the other way around, of course, and that, that's the one that, that we're working for, is that you are moving up the ranks by uh, being more and more competent, that you find uh, the best politicians, uh, that you are aware of how you can uh, navigate in an international environment. And, to be quite honest, that will mean sometimes that, of course, you have to enter into a dialogue with the ones that you are not normally agreeing with, that are coming from countries that you're not normally agreeing with. But in order to have the bigger picture, if, if you want to change, if you want to reform, you, you, you can't do it by only having an alliance with the Scandinavian countries or the Western European countries. You, you need simply to, to have a dialogue with, with others as well. But, but we just see that that dialogue can only be better if you actually are a competent politician from the beginning. Daniel Chao uh, from Paraguay, to so again, uh, especially for your last answer. Uh, with this thing about Grondona and Leo's fell, Teixeira, Avalanche fell, you talk about this Mexican guy, he fell. Uh, Grondona is the old guard, and you have this Bertain guy you, you presented, he's rising very fast. So, do you think Argentina is the our country is the reference in Latin America from now, and if this alliance could revive Buenos Aires' desire to host an Olympic, because if I remember, Buenos Aires and Rio, they started together to host, or having Rio so close is, is, is a very far dream for, for you guys. Thank you. Yes, in, in the 90s, Argentina and Buenos Aires defeated Rio to be the 2004 Olympic game, the, the city, uh, finally assigned to Athens. Uh, and in the first uh, round of votes, Buenos Aires was better than Rio. Um, some years later, our, uh, the economy of, of, the, of, the, of the country exploded. <laughs> I can't imagine what Olympic games we, 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 we should organize. Um, the, the, in Olympics, I, I think this man is uh, is, uh, is not all men ever think he's sixty something. So he will be in the in the. I, I, my my sources said that in the last assembly in Buenos Aires, someone, some, when I said someone, I, I imagine the Sheikh, the Kuwaiti Sheikh, offered. Uh, uh, Vertain to be uh, a member of the uh, executive committee of the IOC, and he said, "I mean, it's too soon." Um, he was uh, he realized uh, of the jealousy of, of many other people, so so uh, so fast his, his growth. Um, and in in case of Grandona, yes, he's very old, and all South American guard is very old. He's retired. He's corrupt. Teixeira, Avalanche, all of, all of them. And 
there is a new, it was just uh, one month ago, a new movement, uh, a very important movement. It, the, the, the best players, former players of South America were there in Sao Paulo. There it was Maradona, Romario, Chilaver, many of the great players of Latin America and the world, but from the region, were there. I was with Chilaver just some weeks before and he told me, hey, we will meet, um, it's a secret, we will have a meeting there because we are thinking in the poor players that has no money and these uh, sports officials full of money, hotel five stars, all that, so and so and so. And first I, I, I believe in his speech. Uh, and afterwards when the meeting, it was in Sao Paulo, uh, I, my source told me it was held by Paco Casal. Paco Casal is the owner of Uruguayan football because of TV. So I said, ah, it's a new boss. Uh, it's uh, an old mafia against a new mafia. Uh, and so uh, they, I think the alliance will be uh, between TV partners, not uh, sports official partners, uh, TV partners. That's in Latin America and the new alliance. Hello, and uh, I'm uh, Taisuke Matsumoto, uh, the Japanese lawyer, and my question uh, for uh, Professor Donnery. And uh, I'm uh, involved in some professional uh, players association with uh, Walter Palmer uh, in Global Union. And, and um, I think it's a more serious problem that uh, the amateur athlete, uh, especially the student athlete, uh, don't have a uh, don't have a prayers association or uh, any representative, and so uh, I'd like to hear your opinion uh, about uh, what is the most uh, effective method or system to hear uh, student uh, athlete. Uh, so, uh, what, what is the most effective method or system that uh, sports federation like NCAA uh, hear the student athlete voice? It's a shame that student athletes would need to have a, a voice when they should be protected as students uh, uh, anyway. Um, the one country where student athletes need a voice, well, the one country that we know most about is the United States, but I also understand in Japan and Korea, uh, student athletes are. Um, uh, have difficult time finishing their degrees, achieving a full education, um, and, uh, and that uh, discipline is strict uh, for those athletes. Um, the students in the United States are now, and again, I mean, not for the first time, they're talking about forming a student athletes union and any kind of collective endeavor has to be good any sense of uh, of solidarity that uh, you know that um, that those who control sport find very easy to break up uh, unfortunately and that's why i was when, when i was talking today about you know we need to find some way to support that solidarity among athletes um, uh, you know, uh, divide and conquer, the team selection procedures, all of those kinds of things get used to break up uh, any emerging formations um, of, of uh, student athletes or amateur athletes. Well, there's no amateur athletes, I suppose. Non-professional athletes uh, uh, these days. So, yeah, I think it's really difficult, but, uh, but I, I don't think we should just despair of it. I think we need to uh, uh, attempt some really creative thinking um, uh, that will help and, and support the emergence of, of such formations. So I'm sorry there is no easy answer to that to that question. Okay, one last quick question. Gret Hartmann, freelance journalist from Germany, and my question goes to Paul and to Michael. Uh, Paul, uh, your stats for me was uh, have been the perfect proof 
that uh, these uh, sports vendors from the US and Europe in fact are not uh, representatives of their democracies in sports, but uh, representatives of their own. Because if you look at the status of good governance in sports, you can count them through from Samaranch uh, or Petike from, from Ireland, uh, Marius Fitzer, the new sport court president, take them all, Pat McQuaid, these are not Democrats. They, 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 are, they care for their own, for their association, for their profit from sport. Uh, so I find it a little bit dangerous uh, to uh, to to make to put to make a link to draw a link between uh, uh, sports leaders from democratic countries and a chance for better governance in in sports. Uh, I don't see that link until today. And uh, when I put this together with your stats together with what Michael told. Uh, uh, Mikael told uh, about the status of governance in pure European, you could say democratic, mostly democratic countries, the status of governance there, that seems to back my theory that they are not representatives of democracies, but of their own, they are uh, socialized within the sports family. And so uh, more power, uh, more sports leaders from Europe or US don't mean uh, at all that we, that we get more democracy, more transparency in sports. But my question is, uh, what chances do you really see uh, to, to influence uh, uh, such sports leaders from uh, uh, democratic countries? Uh, yeah. That's the question. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, what I think is actually, when, when we have looked at the list and see that, that leaders from, from democracies are overwhelmingly uh, represented, I think you could might start also have a dialogue at a national level because most of these, these leaders are coming from organizations that are, you know, in, in a situation where they are, I mean, the government from those countries are not too close, they are democratically elected and mo most of those sports organizations are funded by public money. And, and therefore you could, I mean, this is not a quick fix of course, but when I see these countries, and if you really find some of the, 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 the problems that you, you, that you are identifying clearly, I don't know how far it will come and I, I don't, I, I'm not saying that this is easy, but let's go into Visa and then, then have, a, have a situation with the, with the Romanian government. Uh, who is maybe not the well? They, they are democracy uh, now, and and then started of course start dialogues with the with the national uh, governments about how are you supporting sports organizations? What are the uh, requirements for for the money that are given? And by that, and again, this takes years for sure. But then start the dialogue at that level because I, I don't see we. I mean that, that's what I. Sometimes when we also discuss uh, FIFA and others, uh, sometimes I see why, why we're not putting uh, the sponsors and the governments up for up for uh, accountability instead of instead of uh, only going for for the for the head. Maybe we should go for the body as well. And I, I see that uh, if you want to have a discussion about if we can use this list to anything, let, let's start also in in in, in, a, in a, having a, a national discussion uh, about, about how. How are we uh, selecting these uh, leaders that are, are moving up the ranks? Um, yeah. One last comment. John, you're so silent. That's the <laughs> sad thing of being the first. <laughs> Got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, you're a bit pessimistic about the dialogue. You use the word capitalism. And you know, I think, immediately on revolution. Um, maybe the organizing of the, the athletes is necessary for the court that we have uh, legally uh, recognized athlete representatives who go to the court to fight what Declan Hill called, we are in war, to fight the war and let judges say, it's over, you oligarchs. 
Please comment on it. Well, in fact, uh, I'm glad I see Declan in the back there. I was actually going to start to say that, you know, I feel like I'm fighting war all the time in um, the way in which academics has gone, the way in which the um, transition from, uh, let's say, when, when Peter started and even when I started, you would see critical analysis, critical sociology coming out of academic departments. Most of those positions, go look at the ad to replace me at George Mason University right now. Straight up sport management, how to you know how to service the industry of sport without questioning what it is we're actually servicing, and so that's that's the fundamental point for me. And then the the sort of spinoff of that is well, what we'll now do is we'll advertise positions in sport and international development, which is kind of where the critical social science people can be holed up. It's kind of like when. Gender studies and African American studies departments were created in the United States. We can speak to diversity, but all the diversity is over here. And and my you know my fundamental problem with that is that we don't critique the term development, and we don't start with a notion of well, uh, what about sustainability? You know, uh, you know, development may not be sustainable. Uh, and in many cases it's not because these programs parachute in. Look at all the attention on South Africa 2010. N now everybody's talking about Brazil. Nobody's talking about South Africa and what's going on because the show has moved on elsewhere. And we follow the show. And so my problem is, you know, we, we keep following the show. You know, and that's a global issue. No, not Peter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we're together. Yeah, but uh, but no. In terms of in, in terms of athletes' rights, I think this is this is fundamental because the the kind of exploitation that exists uh, in the NCAA in the United States is reprehensible. And to get to to get to your question about uh, about law and and how you do this and form unions, sadly, what has tended to happen is, for example, the resistance to the implementation of Title IX, which was supposed to help create gender equity in education. The resistance of athletic departments to that has largely been based in what they call the revenue-generating sports of football and men's basketball. And the argument goes that they kind of bring in all the money that gets distributed to everybody else. So immediately what's going to happen is the football players and the basketball players are going to be in this sort of high-end professional level. And you find the impoverishment that exists among most athletes will kind of continue as they struggle through if the system, if the system changes in that direction. So I think it's, you know, it's our role to keep pushing the button, but to, to not just buy in and accept, well, the IOC is the way it is and is always going to be that way, or, or the way in which sport is organized or, or physical activity is organized it is is on a on a neoliberal capitalist basis. You know, that's the case in the U.S. That's the case in the U.K. And in the last session, somebody told me not to follow the Norwegian model of sport. My problem is the Norwegian model is adapting to the Anglo-British model, and that's a fundamental problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo. I was I was I was tempting. I was tempting. Immature. Yeah, yeah. I was tempted. Maybe if I had a couple of wine glasses. Definitely. You would have said it and have you had an eye. And my favorite Shakespearean movie, as I once said, 